Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Physics 152, the new number. Uh, previously, Physics 3, uh, but now 152 with this new numbering system. Uh, my name is Dr. Aaron Lee. Dr. Lee, Professor Lee is fine, uh, and I'm going to be the lecturer for, the, uh, for this course. We are going to do something a little different than what you probably did last semester in Intro Physics 1. This is going to run as a flipped classroom. And so what a flipped classroom is, is that, like you are right now, you are going to watch the lectures, which will be pre-recorded in advance, and you will watch a particular lecture in advance of attending a class. So for example, this lecture is assumed that you will watch and take notes on this particular class, this particular video rather, before attending the first day of class on Monday. And so the idea here and this is really in response to, this used to be a course that met four days a week. So traditionally, us in the physics department would kind of have three days of lecture with one day of problem solving. You kind of mix some smaller problem solving in, you know, with the other three days of lecture. But now that we're losing that whole day, it really does constrain the amount of time we have, not only to cover concepts, but to give you guys practice actually doing problems which is really how you learn physics, right? You do problems, you know, to try to help solidify the ideas and the concepts that you've been learning about, as well as give yourself some practice on the mathematical techniques that are necessary for the course and for solving the problems. So what we do here with a flipped classroom is this allows us to have a lot more time in class to spend in group solving problems. So the idea is that by watching the lecture in advance, you can then come to class, which then we can spend the class time. So the class time will be spent kind of doing kind of in-person in demos. You know, I think demos are much better if you can do them in person and see them. Uh, I will do some, some demos in these videos. And we'll typically just link to videos of demos being done. But a lot of demos we'll try to do in class so you can see them done. So we will use the in-class time to do kind of in-class demos and then break into groups and solve just a worksheet of problems related to the material that you just covered uh, you know, after watching a particular video. So it helps to reinforce the material and gives us an entire 65 minutes to then spend doing problems. So you might think, and if this is new to you, you might be wondering, ugh, you know, originally like I would only have to come to class, you know, three days a week and I would have lecture and then we do problems. Now you're telling me I not only have to come to class three days a week, but I also have to watch three hours worth of videos uh, every week. Now, aren't you essentially asking me to do double the work? Well, that's not how I would think about this, right? For a class that meets three hours a week, using round numbers, it is then typically assumed that you're going to be spending six to nine hours outside of class studying, reading, doing problem sets, etc. I am simply reclaiming some of those six to nine hours back. I'm taking three of them back. So you can still think of the three hours of videos that you're watching as you attending the lectures. What you would have traditionally done in, you know, if this were not a flipped class. But then I'm taking three, three additional hours that you would traditionally be doing you know, studying or doing problem sets. Uh, but I'm going to have us essentially be studying together. We'll be doing problems together in class, working in groups. You have me, you know, as a resource, right? So that then after you listen to the material, you then get practice doing problems. You can then go off on your own, further study to make sure that these ideas get solidified and then also tackle the problem sets uh, that, that you will have assigned to you that you will do on your own, which will be problems that will more or less reinforce and be very similar to the sort of problems that we do in class. So you can think of the homework sets as a way to kind of self-test yourself as to whether the material that we did in class, you know, in the lecture and then practiced working on in class together, whether or not you fully understand it. Because then if you can do the homework, that you're probably in pretty good shape. So I would not think of this as I'm doubling the workload. Just think of it as I'm taking some of the time you would have been using studying uh, but I'm just making sure that we're studying it in, in a very, you know, a very um, concrete, specific way, right? One that in particular has me as a resource available to you. Uh, so I think this is kind of a heightened 
you know, kind of studying. Uh, because I think you get a lot more out of doing these problems in groups together and with me around. Um, and then you can go off on your own and further develop your understanding of these ideas. So my suggestion for how we tackle these flipped classes is that you should invest in a notebook, unless you're using, say, a tablet, an iPad, or something like that to take notes. You should invest in a, you know, a single physical notebook uh, that will be the notebook for your notes, right? The notes that you take in class. Uh, and again, by in class, I, I really should have said, the notes that you take when watching these videos, right? You should treat these like lecture. You should take notes on, on, the, on, these, on these videos as if you were listening to me lecture in class. And we'll talk a little bit about what that might look like as I go on to some of the material for today. And then you should bring this notebook or your iPad that has these notes on it with you to class every day. Because one, you might want to reference the material as we do problems in class. And also I will occasionally have kind of a spot check where I might ask to see all your notebooks just to make sure that you're actually doing, you're, you're watching the videos. Or I may also have very, very short five minute comprehension quizzes that we will do at the very beginning of some of some classes, not all classes, but some classes, where it will be a very, very short, you know, you know, essentially one problem that you have five minutes to do. Uh, and it will be a, the sort of problem where if you actually listened to the lecture and took notes, you will have a very, very easy time doing it. And I will even allow you to use the notes that you took on the lectures uh, with, you know, you can access and, and consult them as you take these very, very short five minute quizzes. But again, if you don't watch the videos or if you don't take notes on the videos, then you don't have that you know, available to you uh, when we do these very short quizzes. Or when again, I do these kind of quick checks of, on your notebooks just to see how you're, you see that you're taking notes and I can maybe give some immediate feedback on kind of how your, how your note taking is looking. Uh, Cause we wanna make sure these notes are you know, meaningful and useful in, in a way for you. So, the goals of this course, uh, second semester introductory physics uh, for majors and uh, kind of math, you know, chem majors as well, is that we will be building upon the physics ideas that we're covering in the first semester, um, but extending them to a concept involving electromagnetism. So this will involve us talking about things like charges, you know, positive and negative charges, which you are likely familiar with or have some intuition about. You know, electrons, protons are examples of things with negative and positive charge, respectively. Then we'll be thinking about what happens when we take a bunch of those charges and make them start moving. We call that current. Uh, so currents and wires, we'll, t we'll be thinking about circuits. You know, when you build a, a DC circuit, you know, a circuit, a light bulb that's attached to a battery, what's actually going on? Why is the light bulb lighting up? Why doesn't the light bulb light up when you don't have it attached to a battery? And then we'll also be looking at magnetism. So magnets you are very familiar with, I'm sure, and I played with you know in elementary and school and high school, you know, labs. And we'll be thinking about how there is a deep, deep interplay between electricity and magnetism. They might sound like two completely disparate subjects. You know, stuff that has to do with charges and then stuff that has to do with, you know, bar magnets, north and south poles and stuff like that. You know, how could these things be related at all? Turns out they are deeply related. They're in a sense, two sides of the same coin. Uh, that's why we call it electromagnetism, right? You really can't get one without the other. And we'll see examples and develop the theories um, and some of, the, some of the mathematical underpinnings of why that is. Uh, that really magnet magnetism and, ele and electricity really are fundamentally related to one another. And I have a couple small demos uh, that I can do right here to show you that there really is something going on when you have either electricity, something happens with regarding magnetism, and then when you have um, magnets, it can have some interesting properties that seem a lot like electric currents. So let's see, maybe the easiest thing to do here is to move my camera. So let's go on a journey. Do, do, do. All right, I'll put this here. Let's see. 
that should work. Um, and I'll bring it. I'll bring the demos closer to uh, closer to the camera. So let's start with you know just some simple ideas of what we're going to be thinking about in terms of understanding what's going on when we talk about electricity and magnetism. Like you likely remember from, I guess I should be on camera. You know, you likely remember from you know high school, high school physics or high school chemistry that you know when you have two positive charges and they're near one another that you would say well they're going to repel one another if i have two electrons they're going to repel one another like charges repel opposite charges attract but we can now start we have the sophistication as you know budding scientists and physicists and engineers and what chemists and whatnot that we can start to ask why is that the case if you imagine two charges that, you know, two protons, say, that then repel one another, and one's, one's here and one's here, and they're separated by some distance, right? It might be a couple nanometers if it's, say, the two nuclei of atoms, uh, or it could be, you know, you know, like, you know, a couple inches or a meter. But nonetheless, they repel one another, even though they're not touching. And if you think back to physics one, that might seem weird. Because forces, you know, when we did Newton's, when you did Newton's laws to death, um, always involve things touching one another. Uh, you know, boxes rolling down, you know, on inclined planes. You know, s springs, you know, making boxes bounce back and forth. Um, all, you know, things spinning in a circle. You know, like a ball attached to a rope that I spin. All these things had things touching one another, and that caused forces, which then caused accelerations by Newton's second law. But then there also, in physics one, was that one exception, gravity, where I could have something not touching the Earth, and yet I know the Earth is pulling down on this object, and it falls towards the Earth because of Earth's gravity. Even though this thing is not necessarily touching the Earth right now, yet Earth's gravity does something that makes it want to pull towards the surface. So there's this spooky action at a distance where it seems like you can have forces arise even though things are not touching one another. This bugged physicists uh, for a very long time before we developed, you know, what is now kind of one of the big concepts of modern physics, the idea of the field. You know, a gravitational field, uh, which we could have talked about in physics one, but it's a little bit too complicated at that point. But now we're a little bit more sophisticated and we can start talking about this idea called a field. So we'll talk about something called the electric field and the magnetic field. The electric field essentially is how a proton, for example, could let itself be known to the rest of the universe. So if there's another proton nearby, it's aware that there's a proton nearby and it will want to repel itself. Or if there's two opposite charges, you know, there's an electric field that makes each other's presence known, even though they're not touching one another. And that kind of sends a signal that says, hey, there's an opposite charge nearby, let's attract to one another. And then there'll be a similar sort of idea that we develop with the magnetic field. And these things, right, do lead to forces, right? We just talked about protons, you know, repelling one another. You know, if they accelerate, you know, and start moving and their velocities are changing, that's an acceleration. We know that must arise because of a force. Similarly with magnetic fields, right, you can imagine, you probably did this, right, in a high school class where, and I think you'll do this in a, in a lab, we have some sort of bar magnets on the north side and the south side. And you might sprinkle, you know, iron shavings around. You notice that they kind of form, you know, this kind of dipole image of things kind of, it looks like something's coming out of the north pole and then goes, wraps around the south pole, right? You're essentially mapping the magnetic field in that case. And that magnetic field, if nearby other objects that can respond to magnetic fields, right, might attract, you know, in this case, attract one another. In this case, this magnet is holding up this little iron piece. And the thing that's interesting is that the forces that we're going to be talking about in this course are really strong. Again, if we think back to physics one, you know, you know, without the magnet, this thing left on its own would fall to the ground via gravity. The entire Earth is pulling down on this little thing and causing it to fall. But then when I have this tiny, wimpy magnet, you know, it's not a strong magnet by any means, 
It not only is barely holding up this thing, it's very easily holding up this thing. And you have to think, well, if you think back to physics one, that means there's some sort of force balance going on. Gravity, the entire Earth is pulling down on this thing. Yet this wimpy little magnet is pulling up. And wimpy really isn't the right word. This magnet is easily winning against the entire Earth. Really, it's the Earth that seems kind of wimpy. Because this little magnet is doing a way better job pulling this thing upwards and holding it up against the entire Earth, pulling it down from gravity. Electricity and magnetism are very, very strong forces. Um, uh, if we were not all more or less electrically neutral, uh, we would be, you know, the world would be a much different place if these forces were dominant no matter what we were doing. And you can kind of see again, you know, with the idea of a, of a magnet and this little dangling metal piece. And if I bring a magnet nearby, right, I don't need to touch it, but eventually it gets close enough that it will pull the thing over and then eventually they do come in contact with one another. But it did not have to touch it first, you know, it just came nearby and then the thing started to move. Again, there's some force going on even though the things are not touching one another. Now how does this relate, how, do, how then does electricity and magnetism relate to one another? Well, let's take one case of electric current. So I have here a, very, a nine volt battery. And then I have some wires, which I'm going to attach to the battery. So I have a positive end and a negative end. We don't have to worry too much about definitions right now, but I have the two ends. And then I also have this, this uh, nail that's wrapped in copper. And just left on its own, you can imagine that if I do, if I bring these two wires and connect them, I create a simple circuit, right? The battery is connected to this kind of loop of wire. Current will then begin to flow. And by that, we mean charges will start to flow out of the battery through the, through the nail and then back into the battery. We'll deal with that, you know, in a few weeks time. But left on its own, there's no current that really is flowing in this case. And if I bring this nail up to this, you know, to this washer, you have to stop moving. You know, I can touch it, but it doesn't really do anything. All right, there's nothing really going on here. It doesn't seem to stick. It doesn't seem like there's any sort of attraction between these things they touch. And then I, if I pull away, nothing really happens. Now I'm gonna connect this to make a circuit. So in this case, and this is a battery, so I'm not going to jolt myself or anything, you don't have to worry. So now that these things are connected, there is a current that is now running through this iron nail. In this case, if I bring the nail and touch it towards, towards the thing, you already notice it's kind of moving when I brought the, the nail nearby. If I touch it, notice I can kind of pull it back it's as it, right, there seems to be some sort of attraction that is going on. It's not very strong, uh, but there is some sort of attraction that is going on between the nail and the, um, in this case, the little, the little screw. There we go. Right, so it seems like, oh, there, look at that. Right, so, and then as soon as I disconnect the, the battery, it goes away. So by having a current flow through this thing, this thing suddenly became a magnet. So there, again, something about current did something to this thing that also created magnetism. That's one example. Now let's look at this thing. You'll play with these in lab. It was called an ammeter. Essentially what this is telling you, it's a device that it tells you whether or not there is current flowing through this loop. So this is kind of let me just disconnect it for right now and just explain what the ammeter is. So if you look at it, right, if it's at zero, and it's not because I'm shaking, right, this is just specifying that there is no current flowing through this device, right, where if current is flowing through this thing and then out this thing, for example, current would be flowing. And then this thing would read positive or negative, and that just depends on the direction it's going in. Let's not worry about it right now. Let's just notice that when it's by itself, it's zero. This thing is nothing but just a big coil of wire, right? Essentially, you can think of this as just a big uh, copper loop. 
so that if I connect these things, all this has done is I've created a very simple circuit, though no battery, right? So if you notice, right, there's no current that is flowing, and it's still reading zero. There's nothing that's driving current, right? But this is connected where I could go out this thing, go into the loop, go around the loop, come out the black, and then go back into the device, and then start over again. But again, without a battery, there's no reason for current to flow. Um, we'll think about why that is. Uh, and there's no current really going by. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this very powerful magnet uh, near this loop. We're going to see what happens. So again, here's the ammeter. It's reading zero. I'm just going to wave this magnet near the loop. Notice what's going on. The dial is moving. It suggests currents flowing. Now, as a good scientist, you might be saying, is it really because currents flowing, or maybe is the magnet you know, causing this needle to move? Well, great question. Let's do that experiment. So if I unhook these things so I can bring it near the camera, right? You should notice that zero current once I stop shaking. Now I'll just kind of move the magnet nearby doesn't really seem to be doing anything. doesn't seem like the magnet has any effect on this device by itself. Then if I, you know, move the magnet kind of near the loop, of course nothing is happening. These two things are disconnected. And then if I hook them back up, so again, that this is a circuit. And then wave the magnet nearby. The thing goes crazy. There is something that is driving current to move. And we could even do the experiment where I could get longer wires so I could move this thing even farther away from the amp from this device so that you are fully convinced they're not interacting with one another. But nonetheless, it seems like something about this magnet is causing current to move. So what's going on there? I think it's even more interesting that if I take this big old magnet and just hold it perfectly still, notice it goes back to zero. Seems to only be when I wave this magnet around that it moves. So it has to do with something about the magnetic field, but then the magnetic field has to be uh, moving? Something has to be going on that causes this thing to go, because if I hold it stationary, nothing happens. So something about the magnet is creating current. So hopefully maybe that, in, you know, kind of teases the idea that we will be exploring the relationship that is going on between electricity and magnetism. They are fundamentally related. And then the course will end after we explore electricity and magnetism with a short foray into optics. You know, so thinking about things like I have this I have the square it's kind of pretty you know but then if I rotate it it's kind of different colors depending on the way I rotate it and you can do this and kind of can get kind of cool shapes so light that is passing through this thing is behaving differently you kind know, of based on the material that it's hitting on the side so something's going on here of how light interacts with this material uh, and we'll delve a little deeper into say how you know glasses work, right, um, or how mirrors work. Um, it, it's kind of a nice kind of simpler topic, you know, after this kind of long semester of, of more complicated topics, but they are, it is nonetheless an extension of electricity magnetism. I'll just give you the spoiler right away. Turns out that light is actually just a combination of electric and magnetic fields. Uh, those things that make protons move from away from one another, that magnet that makes you know metal track to it, uh, put them together, and it turns out you can get things like light, uh, which is pretty cool. So hopefully that kind of motivates kind of where we're going, and we'll be delving into the mathematics of this. Um, and I know uh, at this stage a lot of you are kind of still developing your calculus-based skills. Uh, don't worry, this class is going to help you kind of get some more sophistication with kind of using calculus to solve physics problems. And we'll be using, and we'll be dealing with um, admittedly more abstract concepts than what we covered in physics one. 
Uh, but um, I think together and with this approach, um, we should have some fun along the way, uh, even though there will be some times where the topics will be quite challenging. Um, but I think ultimately very interesting and really gets at, you know, big ideas in modern physics. But what I want to start with this very simple kind of first lecture before we get into any of that is to do a little bit of review on dimensional analysis and units. And I think units again. All right, didn't we do units in physics one? Well, yes, but units are fundamental in science, right? A number is meaningless without a unit, right? The example I always give is if I ask how old you are and you say 20, I might intuit that what you mean is 20 years old, but nonetheless, I had to assign a unit to that number for it to make sense. I treat you very differently if you are 20 years old versus 20 days old versus 20 hours old. The unit is what gives the number meaning. And also, I will say this ad nauseum, units never lie. You do this very long, complicated derivation where you're just you're trying to solve for the length of something, uh, and you ultimately, at the end of the day, get that the answer is three seconds. Well, even if the number is supposed to be three, the fact that you got three seconds, I don't even you know, just means something's wrong, right? You can't have a length that's equal to time. Uh, the units can usually reveal if you've made a mistake, even before you even bother plugging in numbers. This also gets to the ideas of dimensional analysis. You know, when I say a 3D object, what do I mean by 3D? That means that the object itself, you know, spans three dimensions in space. So if I talk about, say, the volume of a sphere, I know a 3D volume, right, has a dimension that should go as length cubed, right? Length times length times length. And there's some formula, of course, there's fours and pi's and threes you know, that are attached, you know, that are when you actually write down the formula. Um, but nonetheless, the units do tell you, right, you can say something about the units right away. And often just doing dimensional analysis on equations can usually lead to um, meaningful results. So let's review kind of the three rules of units. Now, again, as we think about how you take notes for a flipped class, it is one thing to copy down what I write on the board or write on the screen in this case, right? That is one thing to do, right? If I'm writing it down, chances are it's probably important. I will also work through examples, which hopefully you will write those down too. But what I would also encourage, right, sometimes I like using like a two-thirds, one-third rule where you use kind of the left two-thirds of the paper and that is where you write down kind of what I write down. But then you use the right one third of the, of the paper to have your own elaborations, your own clarifications, your own extensions that try to go beyond what I just said. Or maybe I say something that I didn't write down you, that you found meaningful. You could write that down too as well. But you don't want to just kind of blindly, you know, copy what I'm doing, right? We're not scribes. Instead, right, you want to you know, kind of take what I'm saying and translate it into a way that is meaningful to you, which might mean just copying down what I write. Um, but I would encourage you to think maybe don't necessarily always copy down it the way I write things exactly, but try to write, reframe it in your own words or do the two thirds, one third thing where you kind of write it down, write down what I write down on one side. And then maybe you try to paraphrase or try to, you know, um, elaborate uh, or clarify in your own words, right? Because the more ways you try to think of how you can explain something, the more that concept will start to solidify in your mind and start to make more sense. Um, by you drawing connections to other things that we've talked about in the course or in other courses, um, or just by drawing connections between topics within the same lecture, um, it makes you actively engage with the material. And the nice thing about recorded videos is, of course, you could always pause, rewind, rewatch. Um, that's also nice, right? So if you have to miss, you know, so if you have to miss a class, right, you'll miss some problem solving, but you always have access to these lectures um, as well as, which can be helpful, say, when you review as well. 
So let's review um, now kind of what I think, I think you can boil down everything you need to know about units uh, into three rules. I've never seen them really written down like this. So I'm gonna call it Lee's rule of units. I'm gonna be egotistical that way. Uh, so here's kind of, I think, you know, if you understand these three rules of units, um, you more or less understand everything you need to know about units, as long as you can then apply them. So the first rule, and typically these come up, you know, in a physics context in that we're typically working with equations. And equations in a physics course, right, the symbols have physical meaning for one, right? V isn't just V, all right, but it might stand for velocity, right? That, spec that is something that is more concrete, you know, compared to a math course, because velocities, I'm thinking about motions over time. That also comes associated with a unit, right? Velocity, right, in MKS, right, we'll, we'll continue using MKS uh, in this course, of course. Uh, so we know that then the SI unit um, for velocity is meters per second, uh, for example. Um, or maybe we have something where we're writing in terms of miles per hour, kilometers per minute. Um, all those are perfectly fine units that so can be associated with speeds or velocities, um, but you know they're nonetheless different units. Um, so knowing what unit you're using is important. And again, we will stick with MKS uh, for the most part. So if we think of an equation, uh, we can. The first rule is that all terms in an equation. have the same unit. And now let's look at an example. So if, for example, I say that I have some equation where I say that V equals uh, alpha times T plus W. You know, this might be some equation for velocity based on accelerations and times and initial velocities, say. And I know that the unit of V, and I'll use these kind of brackets to specify units, uh, is meters per second or kilometers per hour. Whatever it is, it's a length over a time. All right, length over time in this case. I'll use L and T for length and time, right? That gives me the dimensionality. It's a length divided by a time, meters per second, miles per hour. It's a length divided by a time. So if I know that V has units of length over time, that then tells me something about the other two terms in the equation, right? If V is has units of length per time, then the right-hand side, since it's equated by an equal sign, also better have units of length per time. So the right-hand side unit is length over time. And then we can apply, because again, three meters better equal three meters, right? Or a meter better equal a meter, right? If I say three meters equals two seconds, well, that's nonsense, right? So if you have an equal sign, right, it better have the same unit on both sides of the equal sign. We can also then apply rule one in this case. All terms in the equation have the same unit, right? So that also implies that the unit of alpha t is also length over time, and then the unit of w is also length over time. Because I'm adding them together, and again, they better have the same unit if I'm adding them. Three meters plus five meters. Three kilometers, you know, plus, you know, six kilometers. Again, it does not make sense to say six kilometers plus two seconds, right? I can't take a length and add two at a time, right? So when you add and subtract, right, which is then kind of terms in the equation, right, they all better have the same unit. So that's one example. How about this EG? Actually, wait, it's up here with CG. I'll make it red. Here's one example. To give another example, where it's a little subtler. Right, suppose if I told you that y 
is equal to, I don't know, alpha square root of x plus z, and the x plus z is on the square root. And that's all I tell you. And I, the first thing, and the only thing I ask is kind of which two symbols have the same unit, right? Does y have the same unit as alpha? Does x have the same unit as alpha or y or z? Well, again, we can think about three meters plus two meters, right? If I add two things together, they better have the same unit. If I subtract two things, they better have the same unit. Because again, three meters plus two seconds, I don't know what that means. So then this implies that the thing in the square root, right? Because it's two terms they are adding, right? The unit of x better equal the unit of z. You know, whatever it is. So if I knew the unit for one of them, I would know the unit for both, right? Maybe they're both, maybe one's a length, then they're both lengths. Maybe they're, maybe x and z stand for masses, then they're both masses in that case. So again, just the idea that all terms in a, in a particular equation have the same unit. And then I could also say, right, whatever unit y has is then going to be the, unit, the same unit as the entire right-hand side. But then it involves alpha and the square root of, of x and z. And so then we need to know kind of what is the algebra of how you deal with units, which leads us to our second rule, which I can say that the algebra of uh, units match the algebra of, the, of their numbers. So, what does that mean? You know, that means if I'm multiplying two numbers together, I multiply their units together. If I'm dividing two numbers, I divide their units. Um, so again, the algebra of the units match the algebra of their numbers in terms of multiplication and division, and then powers as well, like square roots. All right, so for example, if we go back to our kind of top, you know, first example we had above, where we already stated that the unit of alpha times t is equal to length over time. And then suppose you also know that the unit of t is a time. All right, so you know that the unit of alpha times t is length over time. And then you also know that the unit of t by itself is time. What is the unit of alpha? Now again, this also would be a stage since this is a video, right? You might, I might encourage you to pause the video real quick, see if you can figure it out on your own before I just then work through the answer. Um, you know, if this were a classroom, right, I might have, you know, like multiple choice, think, pair, share, clear, clicker type questions, uh, right, your previous professor might have done something like that. Um, I don't really feel like those are as effective, you know, on a video, um, unless I make the video interactive, which um, I think kind of is more tedious than it's worth. Um, so, but I might encourage you to pause, right, and think about, you know, how you might figure this out. And then if you don't know, that's okay. This is a lecture, right, we're, we're here to learn. Um, or you might try on your own. If you get the wrong answer, you can think about why, what, where did you go astray? Again, it's all about engaging with what you're doing rather than just blindly copying what I do. So by rule two, the algebra of the units match the algebra of the numbers. So if I'm multiplying alpha and t, I'm then also multiplying the unit of alpha times the unit of t. So the unit of alpha multiplied by the unit of t then is the same thing as length over time because that's what let's see there's a laser pointer here there we go right because this and this thing this unit here is the same thing as alpha times t the units of that uh, and but i know this entire thing is length over time so then this product is also length over time 
But then I also know that the unit of t is itself time. So then I also know that unit of alpha times time equals length over time. And then it's just algebra. The unit of alpha then looks like it's L over t divided by t. That's the same thing as L over t times t in the denominator. That's the same thing as L over t squared. Which might look familiar. Length over, length over time squared kind of sounds like an acceleration. Meters per second squared, for example. So then the unit of alpha has some, has some length over time squared. And then this is similar with powers uh, as well. Like you could go back, like I'll leave this as an exercise, right? If I tell you that x plus z, x and z have units of length, but then y also has units of length, what then is the unit of alpha? And you can bet that'll probably be on a problem we do in class. Uh, so you might think about it right now. Um, if x, z, and y also are all units of, have units of length, what then must be the unit of alpha so the algebra works out? And again, you can think of this as just kind of solving for alpha, but you're then solving in terms of the units. In this case, it'll be a little bit more complicated because it'll involve square roots of units, but that's okay. You can take the square root of a unit, right? Just like how in this previous question, we had the power of a unit. We had t squared, t times t. Kind of a corollary that I want to point out here with number two is something that you definitely do not see in a math course. Because again, math courses typically never deal with units. Um, but something that's kind of worth noting for physics, because I think it helps you kind of make more sense about what's going on, is that trig functions, exponentials, and logarithms, logarithms, the inputs to them are dimensionless have dimensionless inputs. It's not how you spell input, inputs. So in a math course, right, you might see something like e to the x. You never actually really see that in a physics course, right? Really what you will see instead in a physics course is something like e to the x over x naught where x and x naught might both be length, so it's e to the, then you have length divided by length, right? So actually what you're plugging into the exponential in that power is dimensionless, right? You will always see something like log, um, doesn't matter the base, right? And it might be something like t divided by t naught or something like that. That's typically what you'll see in a physics context, right? You have a time, maybe divided by a time. Uh, so really what you're, plugging into the logarithm is dimensionless. Now the trig function, you might say, wait a second. You're saying that when you see, that you don't really ever see like sine of t, but you might see sine of say, t over t naught or t, you know, or something like, you know, I'll just do something simple like alpha times t. And my claim is that the thing inside the trig function is dimensionless. And you might say, wait a second. I knew from physics one that we always had to plug in things in radians when we were dealing with trig functions. So isn't the unit radians? Isn't that a unit? You're absolutely correct. Um, but it's one of these funky units that it's both, it's actually dimensionless. Um, we do, the, the definition of a radian right, is kind of defined um, kind of mathematically, but you know, by convention, right? It's defined that you can sweep out two pi radians in a circle. Um, really where that comes from is that it connects the arc length, right? If I take something that has radius r and sweep out some angle, right? It sweeps out some arc. And we could define theta, right? The angle that it sweeps out based on the length of that, that piece of arc. 
But then if I take the entire thing and swing it all the way around, well, that connects to another geometric formula that they were very familiar with, right? The circumference of a circle. They knew that when I swept it all the way around, theta times r, which is the arc length, had to then become 2 pi times r. So a way of defining kind of a, the radian unit is that it's some angle, uh, it's some number that goes between 0 and 2 pi, uh, executing 2 pi when you make the full circle. Um, but really, there was no unit really that ever really originated there, right? Because the arc length, and I'm going to just write it down right off to the side, right? some length of arc, you know, some radius r, and so we've got some angle theta, and then this arc here, let me make it a different color, is, is some length s. Well, the connection you might remember from geometry is that s is theta times r. And if we think of units, S has a unit of, is, is some some length, so the unit of S um, is, has some length. But then I also know the radius uh, is some length as well. So by the algebra, then this theta can't have a unit, else it would not the left hand side and the right hand side would not equal one another. We call it we give it a unit called radians, but really radians are a dimensionless unit. Um, don't worry too much about that if that didn't fully make sense. Um, just make sure that you stick with radians for the trig functions, which itself is really a dimensionless unit. And then you'll notice that the exponentials and the logs that you always deal with, um, your inputs will always be dimensionless uh, in a physics context. All right, so then we have the third rule, uh, the third and final rule, which is unit conversion. Units are converted, oops, converted uh, by multiplying by one, by multiplying by one. But this one, uh, which we call a conversion factor, um, is a ratio that equals unity but has mixed units. And We've seen, you've seen this, uh, you know, converting units, right? It's nothing new, um, but let me write it out explicitly, right? I have three kilometers per second, and I want to convert it to have a unit of meters per second. Well, of course, I can multiply anything by one, and that's this, and nothing has changed. But then I can write that one in a special way, such that it's something that I agree is one, but has mixed units. So I might write it as three kilometers per second. And then I might write this as one kilometer in the denominator is the same thing as 10 to the three meters in the numerator. That ratio, we can agree, is unity. The numbers are not unity, right? 10 to the three divided by one is not one. But 10 to the three meters divided by one kilometer, those, the numerator and the denominator, are the exact same thing. And when I divide the numerator, when I divide the same thing in the top and the bottom, we know that, that they cancel out and you get one. All right, so this is really just a fancy way of writing the number one. But then rule two pops in, the algebra of the units match the algebra of the numbers. So the numbers would be three times 10 to the three divided by one. I multiply the numerator and I divide the denominator. So then the units follow the same thing, kilometers per second. I multiply by meters, I divide by kilometers. And then the algebra you know, is the same, kilometers on top, kilometers on bottom, they cancel. Lo and behold, it looks like then the answer is three times 10 to the three. Then what's left over? I have a meters on the top and a second on the bottom. All right, so it's 10, three times 10, three meters per second. All right, basic idea of unit conversion. Um, 
And again, you choose the, you, you know, there was another way I could write unity. I could have wrote one kilometer divided by 10 to the three meters. But of course, then the algebra of the units would not have canceled everything out. I would have ended up with a number that's three times 10 to the negative three, I guess, kilometers squared divided by meters times second, which technically is correct. Because again, you've only, you've just simply multiplied by one, but I don't know what kilometer squared per meter times second really represents, right? It's not really meaningful to me. Um, I'd much more rather think about things like meters per second, right? So I'll use the right factor that will cancel out what I want to, want to go away and introduce what I want to be the new unit. And of course, if you wanted to convert to say meters per hour, you then do the same thing, converting the seconds in the denominator to having hours in the denominator. So we're, we'll work through problems like that um, together in class. And the last thing I'll, I'll quickly add before we end this particular lecture is these rules apply to calculus as well. Now we'll take some time to review the derivative and the integral and what they represent and what they are down the road. Um, right now, I know you saw it um, in Physics 1, um, so I will just take them as kind of mathematical entities, right? And we'll, get, we'll delve back into the conceptual ideas behind them uh, later. But this idea of units, um, you know, it doesn't go out the window with calculus. And again, this is never really emphasized in a math course because everything in a math course is X and Y. And I don't know Y or X. Haha, uh -huh. it's a terrible joke. But in that case, right, you know, you're always dealing kind of with dimensionless numbers that are X and Y. But again, in physics, we're dealing with things that I have associated with it, units. So let's take, for example, um, I should have an EG here. EG. Right, EG. right, let's take for example, um, I know that, let's not deal with vectors right now, let's just deal with, you know, one dimensional things, right? I know that velocity is defined to be kind of dx over dt, right? Change in position over change in time is velocity, All right? That is the definition. We can think of this as, we can think of this in terms of its units as well, right? I know the units of, oops, uh, the units of velocity might be something like uh, meters per second. I'll, I'll use MKS now, all right? Meters per second, say, is the unit I'm using for velocity. So then by the rules of units, I guess this would be kind of rule one, um, the unit of dx over dt better also then be meters per second. And if we, again, I guess we can think a little bit about what the derivative is. Remember, a derivative is essentially a fancy word for slope, right? The slope, uh, if you have x as a function of time, the slope is the velocity, right? Rise over run, dx divided by dt. So by rule two, this implies that the unit of dx divided by the unit of dt equals meters per second. And don't panic and think that the d's really mean anything, right? They don't add additional complications, right? It's not d times x. The thing itself is, the thing that is being represented is dx. Right, you are probably saw in physics one, right? You mark something like delta x over delta t, right, with some average velocity, right? That's something you probably saw in physics one, right, where you had some change in x divided by some change in t, and that that could span, you know, over seconds. You know, it's not over a very small amount of time. It could be over very large, you know, swaths of time, and then that defines an average velocity. But then. The idea of calculus is you think of things at smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller little increments. So instead of looking from t equals zero to t equals three seconds, you're looking at t equals zero to t equals 10 to the negative nine seconds, right? A very, very, very small amount of time. Um, and when you're getting to these 
what we call infinitesimally small uh, amounts of time. Instead of writing delta t, um, like what we have, uh, where's my laser pointer? What, what we have here, essentially the delta, um, right, which can be kind of big changes. then goes to D, uh, which are absurdly tiny changes. It says changes, right? So whenever you see a little D, right, just means that it means like a DX means a very small change in X. DT means a very small change in time. Uh, you can think of it as the kind of the Greek letter delta and you're just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. That is the realm of calculus. So then the numerator then is just a small change in x, right? It might be x final minus x initial, but they're essentially really, really close to one another. But nonetheless, it's the difference of two distances, right? A final position, an initial position. And we know then that their unit better than, they both better have units of length, right? I can't subtract a length and a time. They better both have lengths. So that makes sense that then right, dx then has units of length, or I guess I'm using MKS, right, is in meters. dt then has uh, a unit of second, a very, very small amount of time. Absolutely identical for the integral. Let's think of, and this will be the last example we do, and then we're done. So if I have, for example, that an equation you might remember from physics one, right, is essentially the opposite, right? Some change in x, right, x final minus x initial, is equal to the integral of v dt. And integrals, uh, again, very fancy way for add up all the things, right? It's a fancy word for sum. Um, where, but again, the realm of calculus is you're adding up an absurdly large number of very tiny things. And that's an integral compared to a sum. So again, we could think that the unit of delta x, if that's meters, right, a final position minus an initial position, right, that better be have a, a, a unit of length or meters. Then that implies that the unit of this whole integral business also better have a unit of meter. But then we can ask, where is that coming from? Well, I know that the unit of V is say meters per second, uh, if it's a velocity. But meters per second is not the same thing as meters. How do I make that second go away? Well, that's where the DT comes in. That dt itself has a unit, right? It's a velocity, right? And you're, you're summing it over very, very small increments of time, right? And we'll, again, review this, right? It's just a bunch of little rectangles and you're calculating areas under the curve, right? So then you have this dt, which has units of seconds. So then when you multiply v times dt by rule two, you have meters per second times seconds, or the seconds cancel. And indeed, just has a unit overall of meters. Um, so again, that dt, right, again, just think of it as a tiny change in time. Uh, and then the, the curly s, the integral, just means that you're adding up a bunch of them. Uh, and again, we'll review all the calculus stuff um, as, we, as we need it. Uh, right now, we're just thinking dimensionally. All right, so then this completes kind of the idea, the first lecture. Um, so again, hopefully at this point, right, you've taken notes, right? And what I might now suggest as we think of strategies moving forward, um, if this were a class where you would, where I was, where you were actually attending lecture and you were writing notes in class, typically in that case, you're kind of frantically writing to make sure, right, you capture everything the professor says before they move on. You know, here, at least you have the benefit that you can stop me, rewind me, re revisit me. Um, you have immense power where you can make me shut up just by pressing the space bar. Um, don't try to do that in class. 
But what so you know, if this were something that where you were taking notes in class, what I might recommend is you know sit on it, you know, and then maybe this night go back to your notes and completely rewrite them. You know, that's always what I would do, right? I would take my notes that I took in class and then I would let, let, let them kind of sit in my mind for a little bit. Um, but then before I start to forget everything, I would take the notes and then I would completely rewrite them, fleshing them out, right? Any things I might've skipped or, you know, were sloppy, right? I would kind of fill in all the blanks. Uh, and have elaborations, maybe look at more problems in the book and include those as further examples, uh, you know, to take your kind of like rough draft lecture notes and really flesh them out. The act of rewriting them is an act of studying, right? Because you're kind of solidifying the ideas as you think about other ways that you can try to explain it. Um, in this case, since you can pause me, um, maybe you feel like your notes are already pretty good. But nonetheless, I would still think of maybe revisiting uh, this, right? Maybe later the same day or maybe the next day, right? And see if you can't kind of add additional things. Like maybe now is a good good place where you can go onto Canvas, see that there might be some optional videos, right? That I might point to from around the web that you might want to look at, uh, or I might point to chapters in the textbook that you might want to look at. Um, you could, for example, go access some of those and then see what material from those you might then include into the lecture notes you've already taken, right? So again, continuing to flesh them out. And whether you rewrite them or not is up to you, but you will always want to kind of, this, this act of revisiting um, is an act of studying, right? And it's kind of an act of kind of re reminding yourself what we've covered. And then also, if you keep revisiting the thing and you still have no idea what's going on, right, then that becomes a great question for class or for office hours. Um, but you don't know whether or not you have that question unless you're doing this kind of you know constant you know revisiting process. So that's my suggestion um, as we kind of move forward. And it might seem like this takes a lot of time, but again, this is an act of study, and it's not like you have to do this and then have to then study for six hours, right? This is an act. Uh, you know, if this takes you an hour, I would say that that is an act of kind of concentrated studying, right? In terms of kind of fleshing out your lecture notes. Because again, you're thinking about the material and trying to build upon it in a way that's meaningful to you. All right, I will see you all soon.